Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so let's continue on with upper GI. And we have two more disorders to talk about. We're going to talk about gastritis, and then we're going to talk about peptic ulcer disease. Um, so both of these are disorders that happen in the stomach. And, you know, um, with peptic ulcer, it can be in the um, early part of the intestines, known as the duodenum. But uh, mostly now we kind of talked about some esophageal issues. Now we're getting into more stomach issues. So um, one thing you might not be aware of uh, about the stomach is, is that it has a lining um, in it that helps to protect it. Like, you know, in order to start to make food um, absorbable and more easily digestible, we have to break it down into smaller pieces. And what your stomach does is it does that through gastric acid. But in order, um, you know, it, in order to support that function, um, the stomach has to tolerate, um, you know, a very low low pH um, or, um, uh, you know, a much more acidic pH. And so uh, it can be very hard on the, on the stomach to have all that stomach acid. So, um, you know, there is actually lining or barriers in the stomach to help protect those cells or that tissue um, from the acidic nature. So um, what happens in gastritis is, is that that barrier that's up that helps to protect the stomach and the um, cells of the stomach uh, and the tissue from getting damage from that um, caustic pH uh, that um, it gets broken down. And so effectively then the stomach is without protection. It's without support that it needs. Um, and, um, you know, problems can form irritation, inflammation, et cetera. So what would cause you to lose your stomach barrier? What would cause you to um, not be able to protect yourself anymore? Um, what can break down this tissue in the stomach? Um, usually it's some sort of infection or irritation. So you can think of the double eyes. Um, and what uh, kind of elaborating on that, you know, some irritants might be, again, those spicy, fatty, acidic foods. And I did double check all of those fruits from the last PowerPoint were all good. So I was sitting there like a big sigh of relief because this is the thing. I know you're probably like, well, shouldn't you know this stuff better? And it's like, I created all of this stuff, but, you know, I'll be honest that a lot of times the information swirls and then, you know, I work or I sleep and I wake up and I'm like, I knew this when I was making it. And so just to show you that, you know, when I'm showing all these strategies about how to study, like even for professors, we're not sitting over here, like encyclopedias just can spit all this stuff out. You know, a lot of the little details, unless we're like, you know, constantly seeing it regularly or come up like, I mean, this is where a lot of my mnemonics and other things come from, which is why I highly Highly encourage you to find, um, you know, ways to make things simpler, to ways to organize things in your brain. That way, when you're like me and you're trying to present something, you know, that you can better understand it. But anyway, so spicy, fatty, acidic um, infection. And we're going to start talking about an infection called H. pylori. This is a really common um, uh, infection that can happen. When I say common, like of the infections that you can get in your stomach, it's probably the most common. And um uh, it's, um, we'll talk about it more later and treatment for it, but, um, it's, it's a common reason that that barrier can be broken down in your stomach. Um, environmental, um, irritants like radiation and smoking can lead to, um, the, uh, breakdown of those cells and then medications also can break that barrier. So, I mean, of course you guys are probably pretty, um, uh, well-versed now aspirin and NSAIDs are a stomach irritant. We worry about them, um, hurting the stomach, but also medications like oral steroids can do the same effect. Um, and then, of course, da, 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 nursing school, aka stress. And it's not just nursing school stress, but any stress um, can increase the risk that that barrier can be broken down. Um, you can have acute gastritis or you can have chronic gastritis. Um, and in chronic, you have the symptoms like we're going to talk about soon. Plus, um, long term, remember when we talked about vitamin B12 deficiency? It's where um, the parietal cells of your stomach lose the ability there's either less of them or they're they've had inflammation irritation like in gastritis and they no longer can release intrinsic factor and if they're not releasing intrinsic factor you cannot absorb vitamin b12 so they end up having a type of anemia we'll talk more about it so what does a patient with acute gastritis versus chronic gastritis complain about 
Um, so acute gastritis, they may complain of a loss of appetite, feeling of fullness. Um, they could have nausea and vomiting, um, usually epigastric stomach pain. Um, whereas chronic gastritis, many have no symptoms or just pernicious anemia. They can have some of the same symptoms as acute gastritis, um, but sometimes it's just like, hey, it's gotten to the point where um, the cells just are so inflamed. Did I want to say dead tissue because that sounds bad because that sounds like it's actually dead, but um, you know, just cells that aren't working. Um, that like, it's just that chronic breakdown. So it's kind of like, it's like, imagine if there was a scab that you had and you just kept picking at it, picking at it. Um, you know, eventually it doesn't start to hurt so much. Like, you know, eventually it gets very, um, you kind of form like a callus almost over it or, um, uh, like, you know, if you have like a callus on your foot, it hurts at first, but over time it kind of builds up that extra tissue and stuff like that. And a lot of that's kind of like chronic gastritis. Um, but with both of them, um, you know, it's, it's more general symptoms. So when you're studying a disorder like this, like there's not like one hallmark symptom, or this could look like a lot of other stuff. So we need to do other assessments kind of further to find out more beyond just symptoms. So um, GI wise, we do pain assessments, um, look for other GI symptoms like loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting. Um, we're going to assess for vitamin B12 deficiency. And do you remember how we assess for this? Hmm. So, um, what do you call it? Um, we can, uh, there's a variety of tests that you can do, um, to check for a vitamin B12 deficiency. And, um, you know, for those tests, it's kind of like two parts. Like first we want to look at if they're anemic, so we can check, of course, a hemoglobin. And then additionally, we want to check to see if they, um, have a low vitamin B12 level. Oh, wait, I don't know how I got to the slide. What happened? All right, sorry about that. Um, anyway, so um, what was I going to say? Um, so we were aware how to assess for vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, also, we want to assess their lifestyle and diet to see if there's any other contributing factors that could have led them to get gastritis. So then further, um, the labs and diagnostics that we're going to do are to rule out other problems um, and to get deeper into what their problem is. Because again, um, gastritis that's caused by an irritant is going to be treated differently than gastritis that's caused by H. pylori. Um, so H. pylori, again, is a bacteria that um, is common for um, to cause problems. Uh, in the stomach. And so the best measure or way to tell someone has H. pylori, of course, is going to be to get in there um, endoscopically and get a biopsy and test it and see that there's H. pylori right there. Um, but um, obviously that's pretty invasive. So um, there are other tests that we can do, um, like a urea breath test um, and then a stool antigen test. Um, now, some of these are more accurate than others because with H. pylori, it's one of those that like, um, I think with antibody tests, like I think your book says like with antibody tests, which is not one of the three I list here, uh, listed here, that those can be positive like long time. So we want to see like it's kind of the difference between, um, you know, with some diseases, like if I got... Um, to like when we talk with tuberculosis, if I had tuberculosis, even if right now my body's not fighting it, I can always test positive for some TB tests. So that kind of stuff. So um, some of the H. pylori stuff is similar where you can always test positive for it, even if you don't have it right now. So we really want to see that you have it right now. So that biopsy, the urea breath test are probably going to be some of the best ones. We can look at their stools too, um, but the more accurate one's going to be the biopsy or urea breath test. And we also want to check for bleeding. And this is more like looking for complications because normally gastritis, there's inflammation, irritation, but there's not bleeding. If it's bleeding, then we start like worrying about, um, you know, some complications like you can have GI bleed, hemodynamic instability, where your blood pressure and other stuff is not stable. So we're going to check for bleeding, do an H and H occult stool. And then we want to rule out any other problems. Um, like I mentioned, just to make sure they don't have some sort of other um, GI problem going on. Um, they may end up having to do some like scoping of the patient and stuff like that, usually just an upper scope. So how do we know a client with gastritis is better? So they're better if they have less pain and or symptoms, um, if they're able to get adequate nutrition and they don't have complications. But if their pain and symptoms are worse, we can't get them the nutrients they need. Because remember, one of their symptoms is a decreased appetite. Um, we're going to be more concerned. And then, of course, complications are going to be things like bleeding, um, gastritis. We're going to talk about gastritis is one disorder, but then we're going to talk about peptic ulcer disease. Um, they're really the same thing. It's kind of like, think of like, you can 
can have CAD like the plaques. And of course I have to bring it back to cardiac, you know, CAD. And then it can become um, where you have a heart attack. This is kind of the same thing. Gastritis is an irritation inflammation, but you know, with a certain degree of severity or with worsening, it can become actual ulcers. Uh, we also want to check for fluid and electrolyte imbalances, especially if they're having nausea, vomiting. And then uh, with gastritis, it can actually burrow through and burrow all the way through the stomach tissue. And that can lead to an acute abdomen, which we'll talk about in the lower GI um, PowerPoints. But uh, acute abdomen effectively means um, the three P's, and that's that they have pain. There is a perforation of some sort of organ or tissue, and then there's peritonitis, which is an inflammation of your peritoneal cavity around your abdomen. I'm pretty much thinking like the, the cavity where all your organs are supposed to be protected gets inflamed, irritated with like dirty stool or gastric contents, um, and it gets infected and it leads to your whole body going into like shock or a really bad infectious process. So it usually um, is very, very serious life or death. So we want to watch very carefully for that. So what do we do to treat gastritis? Most of the time it's pretty self-limiting and they, they just have episodes where they, um, you know, their stomach gets irritated, inflamed, but it passes within a few days. We want to figure out the cause and then avoid it, especially if there's a trigger or something else. Um, we want to prevent and manage nausea, like with the antiemetics we talked about, environmental changes, things like that. Um, if they're NPO, uh, sorry, if they're vomiting, we they may need to be NPO, get IV fluids. And remember, anyone who's vomiting, we always also want to focus our um, nursing care on like oral care. Um, we may need uh, to give them an NG tube if it's severe, again, for that decompression, that's going to help to reduce a lot of their vomiting and uncomfortable symptoms. Um, for acute gastritis, we're also want to do things if like if they pretty much remember normally the stomach has a barrier to protect itself. Um, we've broken down part of that barrier. And so now this acid is can just be really rough on the stomach. So we need to make sure we're doing something to decrease the amount of acid so it's not such a heavy load. Um, on the stomach. And so with that, we might give the PPI H2 receptor blockers. For chronic gastritis, if it's an infection, we want to do antibiotics. Um, and then they're most likely going to need B12 supplementation for life. Because again, the less stomach cells you have that are working, the less intrinsic factor you have, the less ability you have to absorb vitamin B12. So what do we do as the nurse? We're going to monitor their intake and output closely, uh, monitor the, for bleeding and, uh, bleeding and other complications, definitely doing those frequent assessments, looking for changes, because this can be very simple, self-limiting, but um, it can get severe if un, uh, not taken care of. I also mentioned, again, that oral care, making sure to um, help out that patient um, if they are nauseous, and then smoking cessation, um, avoiding medications and things that would irritate the stomach. Uh, spicy fatty acidic and then six small feedings a day because a lot of times these people don't have a good appetite but we can split their meals up and it makes it more manageable so last but not least um, there is a special type of gastritis that's known as autoimmune gastritis and this is uh, where the body attacks itself and breaks down its own cells because that's what autoimmune process is is the body attacking itself um, and pretty much what this leads to is a vitamin b12 deficiency um, and so, um, again, you know, this is the body's attacking itself. And because um, it's attacking its own cells, they lose the ability to secrete that intrinsic factor. And then there is the inability to absorb vitamin B12. So remember, these people need vitamin B12 for life. Uh, and we can't take it orally. And so, um, yeah, there's, I believe there's intranasal and I am, if I'm not mistaken, there's IV too. Um, I could be lying about the IM, but I know that there's definitely IV and intranasal, I think is what your new textbook says. Um, and just know with this, there is a higher risk for stomach cancer. Anytime we're messing up, breaking down, causing inflammation to cells, um, there's a high chance with the cells being inflamed of eventually one day, um, there being a, a higher risk of cancer, just because when cells are getting broken down, new cells are forming, uh, they can start to form abnormal cells. So yeah, I think that's it. Yep. Yeah. That's it. I will see you next for peptic ulcer disease.